This episode of Rookie Hunter is brought to you by the Wild Sheep Foundation. Adventures in sheep country can change your life. And as residents of BC, we're very fortunate to have three different species of sheep in our province. After attending the Wild Sheep Foundation's annual convention, Sheep Show, in Reno, Nevada, we got to see what conservation looks like firsthand. The Wild Sheep Foundation's ability to raise and put millions of dollars on the ground each year to keep these majestic animals on the mountaintops worldwide is unmatched. The Wild Sheep Family is a diverse group of people from all walks of life, and membership is open to anyone. Whether you're a seasoned pro, it's your first time on the mountain, or you just like to see sheep on the hillside, you can sign up and join today. Kelly and I are lifetime members, but you can become an annual member for just $45. You can also become a member of the Less Than One Club, which is the only club you want to get kicked out of. If you've never taken a North American or international ram, you can join us in the Less Than One Club for an extra $25. Plus, Less Than One Club membership also includes entry into a draw for three separate doll sheep hunts, which will be given away at Sheep Show in 2019. For more information on the Wild Sheep Foundation and to become a member, head over to thewildsheepfoundation.org. Hey guys, welcome to episode 77. Today on the show, we've got Corey Pearsall from Sitka Gear. Even though he's from Sitka, the focus of this episode is actually on self-processing. Corey wouldn't call himself a professional. However, the stuff I've seen him uh, make looks fantastic. But the purpose of this episode is to encourage guys like you that are listening, if you haven't already, to try processing game yourself from home. Kelly and I have done a little bit, and uh, we love the process. We want to do more ourselves. So hopefully this knocks down some barriers for some of you guys and encourages you to uh, try making sausages or snack sticks or pepperoni or anything like that from home. Corey's got some great tips, and uh, we hope you guys enjoy this one. We did touch on some clothing-related stuff at the end, but uh, we didn't have much time, so we ripped through that. We will do a clothing-specific episode, I think. Uh, when we meet with Corey at Sheep Show in February. So we'll start collecting questions. Now, if you guys have any specific questions about clothing, it does not have to be related to Sitka. Corey's very open in the fact that uh, he just likes to talk about clothing in general and set people up with the stuff that they need. So if you do have questions you'd like discussed on that episode, send them in to us and we'll start compiling them. Our email address is info at the rookiehunter.com. So if you guys are listening to this on October 16th or just after, that means we are gone on our moose hunt. And hopefully we've got lots of good stories to bring back from that trip. In the meantime, if you want to help us out, please subscribe to the podcast. Leave us a rating or review, mainly on iTunes, but uh, any podcast app provider will do us good to have more ratings and reviews. So please do that. Everything else related to the show can be found from our website, which is the Rookie Hunter. Dot com and please support our sponsors North Arm Knives and the Wild Sheep Foundation head over to their websites or find links to them through ours so sit back relax and yes sober September slash October is finally over crack a cold beer and enjoy this episode with Corey Pearsall from Sick of Gear Kelly Molnar, what's up? Oscar, how you doing? Oh, it's pretty unresponsive. Sleeping as usual. A silver bullet. <laughs> pretty much. Um, seems like it's been forever since I last saw you. Yeah. It's yesterday. <laughs> yeah. You know what's cool, Kelly? We're recording this on, uh, what's the date today? October 4th. But by the time it hits the airways, we'll actually be moose hunting. It's true. Time travel, man. Yeah, I've been doing a lot more, you know, looking at maps and stuff. Yeah. And um, yeah, just getting excited. Nice. Well, 4.30 right on the dot. We've got uh, Corey Pearsall from Sitka Gear joining us on the podcast today. Should we give him a ring? Sure. All right, let's do it. Hey guys. Hey Court. So did you manage to get out of the office or are you stuck there? I'm still I'm still here. I think it's gonna be better for me. Perfect. <laughs> <You> focus. <laughs> yeah, focus in. If I need to Google something, 
then I can at least Google it. Hey, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> if you're scrambling for information, you can find it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Good. Yeah. Welcome to uh, the show. Officially, you made a brief appearance in the uh, Jurassic Classic episode, but um, for those who might have missed that one, maybe just give us a quick introduction, who you are and what you do. Yeah. So my name is uh, Corey Pearsall. I uh, work at Sick of Gear. Uh, my primary focus is uh, customer service leader, um, but also help manage uh, kind of our pro advocate program. Corey, you, you're in Montana now, obviously. Uh, you grew up in New York, correct? That is correct. Yeah. So uh, I was born, you know, long story short, born in PA, moved to New York. Um, when I was 14, we took a family vacation. Uh, to Glacier National Park and uh, had to come back. Uh, so moved back for college and yeah, I've been in Montana for about, I'd say about 12, 13 years, somewhere around there. Cool. Did you grow up in a family of hunters? I did. Um, so funny, I I was the anti, not anti-hunter, that's <laughs> bad. I was, I was the guy that like growing up, like I couldn't watch the sportsman channel. I couldn't see somebody killing an animal. Right. Um, I understood, you know, the whole idea of, of harvest, but I just couldn't witness it. And so I fished, I fished a lot. Um, whereas my brother was the guy who would go out for seven days, you know, bring a, you know, super minimal, bring a package of hot dogs, come back, <laughs> chapped face, half dead with a deer. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and so I had a great mentor. If I wanted it, I just didn't take advantage of it. And then when I moved to Montana, just something, something there, maybe the wide open spaces, I'm not sure what it was, mm -hmm. but um, something about Montana, it just kind of, I don't know if it was the adventure of hunting uh, elk. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know, but it, it be definitely clicked with me pretty quick and has become an obsession. Cool. It sucked you in. Yeah, it sucked it. It definitely did. Yes. Nice. Yeah. It's funny, man, that, that story of, you know, well, Kelly and I come from the same type of background and having, you know, hunters in the family. My old man was a hunter. Kelly's grandpa was a hunter, but for whatever reason, neither of us really took to it. There, the opportunity was always there. But I don't know, man, I, I think there's like some weird connection. Once you, you sort of get what hunting is and you experience it once, then you're basically hooked and there's no turning back <laughs> after that. Yeah. And he was, I mean, offend some people here, but it, I don't know, just some of the shows that you watch, it turned me off just like mm -hmm. describe it without insulting people. So yeah, probably you, but it definitely, it, uh, you know, I'll just, just say that and coming out here and, and having a better understanding of what it really is, yeah. what it should be, what it's not, mm -hmm. um, what some people for some reason have built an image around, mm -hmm. um, you know, it definitely is different. Yeah. I, I noticed a bit of a revolution in the, in the whole hunting media world, at least, uh, you know, you look at Steve Rinella and a lot of these guys that are focusing a lot more on the story. Um, as opposed to the result. So I think that's a good thing. Yeah, I agree. So who was your mentor to, to go out hunting for the first time? Was it somebody with Sitka or just somebody you connected with when you moved out there? Yeah, so there's a couple people involved. Um, but So I started climbing when I moved to Montana as well. And it was actually a couple climbing buddies of mine that were also avid archery hunters hmm. that really got me introduced to it um my buddy eric and uh, a friend dean and they also introduced me to sika which led me to where i am now so i, I i'm sure i owe them more <laughs> than than i've repaid but um they helped kind of get me out and then um my well, my father-in-law actually uh has been uh my best friend when it comes to hunting nice. he's my hunting partner cool and he's been archery hunting his entire life so he's He's very much to thank when it comes to getting me out, teaching me archery, uh, you know, understanding a bugle, how to use it, reads, calls, what they mean, uh, how they should sound. He's definitely still my, you know, the guy that's 100 yards behind me calling in the elk. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Perfect. 
It's always good to have one of those guys around. Yeah. 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 I mean, for him, it's more to see, you know, you got to have one of those guys that's just there to be there, yeah. you know, and loves to be there and would rather see me harvest it, you know. Yeah, for sure. Have you combined the climbing and archery skills <laughs> into one <laughs> no. hunt? Uh, that, I think that's like, that's the, I think that's why sheep hunting and goat hunting are so interesting to me. I have not, uh, been lucky enough to draw a Montana sheep tag or a goat tag. Um, but that's definitely the draw is just getting, getting up and out there. But mm -hmm. no, no, I haven't, I haven't had to apply that. I do sometimes laugh when I see like, you know, images of people repelling off of a cliff <laughs> yeah. go a little bit sometimes. Um, yeah. <laughs> but there, I mean, you know, uh, shoot, uh, we've got a, a athlete, Cole Kramer, who harvested, he was, I don't know if it was he or a client of his who got a sheep that died on cliff, had to use ropes to get to mm. it. So mm. there's, there's a reality. Adam Foss is, I feel like he's always on a cliff ledge someplace yeah. that I'd be roped up on, but he's not roped up on. <laughs> so mm. definitely it's, uh, it's a you could find yourself in that position. Yeah. I guess it's a good time to remind you that I have an audio clip of you saying that you would come up here and be our pack mule. So <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to hold that against you <laughs> yeah. and uh, we'll put some of your climbing skills to use and the, and the rigor. Good. <laughs> yeah. That's <laughs> I can, I can accommodate that. Okay. I can definitely be that guy. Deal. Well, the offer is always open. Yeah. I mean, the one thing that I think about with that kind of hunting too is, as you climb to the top of that summit, you have to think like the weather might be perfect going up, but when you have to come back down, a snowstorm could have hit, right? So it's, that's when the ropes and the, the pickaxe and the cramp on all come into play, right? Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. You just never know. Yeah. You know? Yeah, for sure. Are you primarily archery or you do rifle hunting as well? Yeah. So <laughs> I, I will never claim to be a skilled archery hunter. Yeah. I am a passionate hunter. Um, so I typically going left when I should go right. Um, and so I, I carry a bow, but usually harvest, uh, you know, with a, with a rifle in right. hand. Not a bad way to do it. <laughs> yeah, no. The level of difficulty is uh, it's exponential with a bow, that's yeah. for sure. And if you're trying yeah. to fill your freezer, it's kind of, you know, counterproductive. <laughs> totally. <laughs> yeah. It, in Montana, though, I mean, the elk rut is, is really what draws you in. It's, it's just an incredible experience uh, interacting with elk. Hmm. And that's only archery. So you can only experience that right. uh, if you're an archery hunter. I mean, I guess you can just go out there and experience it, of course. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, they're, they're, they're past their rut by rifle season in Montana. So. It's one of the reasons that draws me to archery mm -hmm. is, is that challenge. How has the season been so far? It's been slow. I, I, I kind of have gone into the season with kind of a meh mentality because yeah. my freezer is full. Right. And I just don't have room for more meat. Um, I also have a one-year-old and a three-year-old. I did get out, though, with a couple of friends of mine uh, from Helena, DJ Berg and Brian Solon. Uh, enter an area of theirs and the first day was was pretty awesome we covered some miles but we got to see um you know six bulls and then you know as we were heading out we got to actually get to within about we were under 100 yards we weren't calling we were stalking um and it just unfortunately didn't play out the way we wanted it to i i when i say we i mean i again not the best hunter um <laughs> thought the bull was looking away but in reality the bull was looking at me uh -huh. and so i kind of got a little too aggressive with my uh cutting the distance yeah uh, mm -hmm. and spooked the bull he didn't take off um but uh you know it ended with them just kind of walking in the opposite direction mm -hmm. yeah still exciting either way though man when you're creeping up that close mm -hmm. yeah it it's it was fun it was i mean we only had i mean our visibility was bad one of our you know, DJ who was there, his range finder only picked up 22 yards because the fog and mist was so thick. Oh, wow. Um, mm -hmm. And so it, that's why I thought he was looking away. <laughs> it mm -hmm. seemed like yeah. he was looking away, but it wasn't. <laughs> nice. Uh, have you got anything else planned for the year? Are you just kind of just getting out when you can? Um, I'll get out after some waterfowl and my wife would like me to get a cow elk. Nice. Um, mm. or something like that. Yeah. So I'll probably get out for rifle season. Um, what I'll end up doing is converting a lot of our roasts, um, 
into probably sausage and condense some of the things we have in the freezer to make room. Nice. Uh, we're running, we're running pretty low on burger. So there you go. Yeah. Well, that's a good segue, man. You've been doing quite a bit of a uh, meat processing and that's kind of what we want to focus on with you today. What got you into doing your own meat was an experience with something you brought in or you're just interested in it or. Yeah, it's a, it was a combination of it. Um, and I like to speak candidly about my, failures because uh it's pretty intimidating you know processing mm-hmm. your own wild game not only does it seem like a lot of equipment but for me it was what if i mess up right like i've just wasted all this meat and that's inevitably what happened to me on the first go um it wasn't all of the meat but um you know i didn't have a scale i just didn't have a few pieces of equipment that i needed and and you know to take a step back for me this whole you know, a lot of the reason I hunt is for, you know, wild game, um, kind of a, a holistic lifestyle, um, to put meat in the freezer that, you know, I guess we can't call it organic because we don't know what, you know, the elk was feeding on. Mm-hmm. That's, mm-hmm. that's my buddy, Eric, who, uh, uh, corrects me every time I say that, but <laughs> it's, it's like as close as you're going to get. Right. Yeah. So, um, so that's always interested me. And so I tried to, to, to process uh, an animal for the first time, um, and had troubles making sausage or broths. Um, and you know, uh, a bit of my breakfast sausage turned out like really strong hmm. because I didn't have a scale. And so that intimidated me, um, for a few years up until I brought a deer to the butcher towards the end of rifle season. And it was disturbing. Like I got there with my animal and there were stacks of other animals waiting to go in. Hmm. And I don't really want to paint that much of a picture because it, it definitely disturbed me enough to go, all right, I need to do something different. I'm not leaving my animal there. Um, and so I just turned around, went home and started really looking at the cost. Right. So to, to process an elk or a deer, you're looking at you know 150, maybe 300 at the most, depending on what kind of sausage or snack sticks you want. Yeah. Obviously, prices vary wherever you're at. And not the, and I don't want to like taking it to a butcher is phenomenal. I will say that like sausages from a butcher are probably better than sausage for me. Um, and so they do exceptional work. And then my my goal isn't to try to tell people not to do that, but I'd love to challenge you to try to do it yourself at the same time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, yeah, so that got me just, you know, back to the drawing board. And there are a few things that frustrated me with my first go around that because of a few friends uh, and an interaction at an event, it gave me the confidence to to do it again, to try it a second time. Um, And, and so, yeah, that's, that's what kind of led me to, to where I am now, you know, I haven't, I'm not a professional, you know, um, as we talk through this, <laughs> you know, um, there's definitely, maybe I'm cutting some corners. I don't, I don't want to say that this is exactly how you should do it, but I don't want you to be intimidated. And, you know, here's some of the things that I've learned that work well for me that make yeah. it easier. Um, you know, that you don't have to jump on a forum and get intimidated by the additives and, all the different words like, you know, oh, you've got to ferment it or do this or do that. Like, right. you know, you don't have to do any of that stuff. There's, you know, you put some sure curry in it and the right seasonings and mm-hmm. stuff it and you're good. Like it's as, it's as simple as that. It can be just as simple as that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Let's start with some of the equipment that you're using and would recommend so far. Yeah, for sure. So one piece of equipment that I think is critical for sausage making that I had troubles with without is a sausage stuffer. Right. Um, and that is, you know, for me, you know, I tried using a, a grinder for the longest time. And the problem with the grinder is you end up, you end up grinding it or the grinder gets too hot. The meat gets too hot. Yeah. You get a hot dog paste consistency. It's right. It doesn't bond well. You break the casings. Don't use a grinder. Go out, spend a hundred bucks, 150 bucks at most on a stuffer. Mm -hmm. Um, and so you've got a grinder and you've got a stuffer. You can, in all honesty, I've been processing elk, entire 
elk, right? 250 pounds meat, et cetera, um, with an $80 grinder. Perfect. <laughs> nice. So it can be, I wouldn't recommend it, but it can, <laughs> right. be done. it can be done. Yeah. It can be done. It takes a bit of time, um, but it can definitely be done. But that, that st- uh, sausage stuffer will, will make snack sticks and, you know, your sausage a hundred times easier. Right. It just makes mm. the, the world a difference. Yeah, it is a little bit finicky when you use the grinder, that's for sure. Even the big electric grinders, it's just, I mean, that's the way we do it. But um, yeah, there's pros and cons, especially with the the temperatures. Yep. Yeah, yeah, temperature is a huge, huge part of it. So it's good yeah. that you mentioned that. We started with a uh, KitchenAid attachment <laughs> and uh, we did probably more than we should have with that and uh, ended up blowing out the the worm gear in the actual KitchenAid. So kind of put a stop <laughs> to that. Mm-hmm. And then <laughs> Kelly uh, purchased a, a pretty nice grinder after that, which makes things mm-hmm. easier. The KitchenAid thing is is good if you're just going to do like a small batch of sausages, but I definitely don't recommend that for anything substantial, like doing a, mm-hmm. a whole whack of elk meat or something like that. It's good to just do one small batch, and I think that's it. Do you have a mixer too, Corey? I do not. And you can definitely invest in a mixer. I should start with, I do 10 pound batches. Mm -hmm. So doing it in my house, 10 pound batches of meat for me is very manageable. When you get to like 25 pounds at a time. Yeah. I definitely recommend investing in a mixer. Uh, It's just too much. I can mix it for about 10 minutes with my hands to start to get that protein extraction where you get the, basically that stickiness Mm -hmm. uh, where it's going to start to bond and just give you a better consistency of meat, not a, crumbly meat i can do that with my hands mm-hmm. um so i just haven't invested in a in a uh, mixer okay anything else on the equipment side of things i'm sure there is um you know some of the accessories that make life easier are those totes um yeah. you know getting a 12 dollar meat tote like right. whatever they're called meat lug or meat mm-hmm. tote um getting one or two of those makes life a lot easier um a smoker uh, obviously is, is certainly going to make things better. I, for two years used what I call the R2D2 (laughs) smoker, which is, you know, one of those bullet looking things, um, with coal, um, Mm -hmm. and just kind of winging it. But a smoker definitely makes the final product a better final product. Yeah. I don't know if you if I'm throwing you all over the place, but do you want to go back and sort of talk about the actual handling of the meat from the very beginning of the process and then kind of work us through where you go from there? Yeah, absolutely. So one thing that I personally need to get better at is recognizing the different cuts um, right. and the different roasts and all that stuff. I pretty much just get in there and I'm like, that looks like a great roast. That <laughs> yeah. looks like a good piece of meat to make jerky out of. That's And so, uh, not the best there, but there is a, a, a link, um, you know, my mentor, his name's Kurt Hyde. Um, you know, if I have a question, I just call him and obviously that's nice to have. Not everyone has that. And, um, you know, if you've got a local butcher, I'd go pick their brains as well. They're usually pretty excited to talk about it, but he's got a, he's got a pretty quick video on how to debone a deer and he definitely throws out, you know, the different cuts and the different roasts, but I, if I know I'm just going to be making meat, yeah. I basically start wherever convenient and just start cutting chunks of meat off the bone. Right. Um, and the first year I did it, I was super picky about all the ligaments, tendons, the white stuff, um, you know, getting the sticky stuff off, um, you know, really particular. And I should actually take a whole nother step back and say, when I harvest an animal, I no longer skin it. So I will hmm. quarter it or debone it um, right there if I'm going to take it out. If I debone it, I process it as soon as I get home. Hmm. But I no longer skin anything. Hmm. And the reason for that is if you skin it and hang it, you get that bark. Right. And then you have to cut that bark off. Interesting. Um, And you waste, I feel like I waste a lot of meat. And some people just process it with the bark. That just makes me cringe a little bit. Right. Um, But then you got to cut off all of that bark, and that even takes a long time. So, um, if you leave the skin on it, you can still hang it as long as it cools quick enough. Uh, it's cold enough outside. And when you get back, you can skin it and butcher it when you're ready. And it, one, keeps the meat from getting dirty. 
two prevents you from having to, you know, skin off the bark. So I, I, again, I just, from there, I just start taking meat off, throwing it on a table and then I start cubing it. Right. Cool. Uh, I'll cube it. And then I do a little trick where, you know, I'll throw some ice into my cooler um, and I'll take a, um, a cookie sheet yep. and most cookie sheets with, uh, I can't remember. I think I've got a 50 liter Yeti that I can fit a cookie sheet in perfectly on top of the ice and I'll just cube it and throw it in there. And that allows the meat to drain some of that blood and I'll leave it overnight that way. Hmm. And that'll get a lot of the blood out of the cubed meat. You won't think there's any cause there's no blood dripping while you're cutting right. it, but you'll come back the next day and the bottom of that cooler will be pretty well filled with blood. Hmm. Hmm. And I personally think that that gets rid of some of the gaminess right, out right. of it. I don't have any evidence to say that that's oh, true. Makes or sense, not, yeah. So, um, yeah, from there, whether you leave it overnight, obviously it has to be cooled. And then I just run it through the grinder. Um, and for me, I I use the, the larger disc. I think it's 3 8 um, I'm not really good with memorizing what those things are, but it's just the larger right. um, disc Mm -hmm. um and just run that through one now the meat's got to be cold we talked about that at first um i mean if you can almost partially free some of this meat in this entire process that's the best way to do it don't do it inside i always do it in my garage hoping that your garage is a little bit cooler um but it's really obvious when your meat is too warm i mean it gets really pasty um, and, and you end up with a bad product. And so it's gotta be, it's gotta be cold. The second part is your blade, the knife has to be sharp. So if that blade on your processor, you know, if you know your meat's cold and it's still coming out pasty, you should just run to the store and pick up a new little blade mm. for your, for your grinder. Right. <laughs> and a quick little tip there that I got is always match your disc to your grinder facing the same way every time. Okay. And what that does is it just creates memories. Um, like as it's processed, right. as it's spinning, it's not dulling itself out on a new surface area. Does that make mm-hmm. sense? Yeah. 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 Definitely. It's, it's staying sharper because it's, you know, it's the same memory. I, I, I hope you guys can yeah, picture so what I'm same, trying to same say. Same kind of where it's, mm-hmm. it's rather than switching back and forth, you're getting something different each time. So. Yep. Yeah. And so that, that sharp blade will definitely give you a better consistency of meat um, as it's produced out of that, out of that grinder. One tip that I've read is that if your hands are going numb, that's usually a good indicator that your, your meat's cold enough. <laughs> So if it's not cold enough like to make that. your fingers go numb, then you should probably throw it in the freezer for a bit. And sorry, just to back up too, with leaving it in the Yeti, you find like, are you, how much ice are you putting in there? And you're finding that it's well cold enough just by leaving it in the Yeti overnight? I do. Yeah. So I, I mean, my trick is I, I mean, I, I'll take ice out of my refrigerator or my freezer, put it in one of those uh, storage bags that you usually put meat in Yeah, and I'll just suck some air out weld the bag shut and just basically make my own waterproof Ziploc bag of ice. Perfect. Um, and then just throw that in the bottom of it. And it's, it's always kept it cold. That's for sure. We'll have to give that a try. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry. I derailed you. You can continue on. (laughs) No, that's, that's okay. I, I, you know, and this is, you know, we're we're talking pretty high level, not, we're not really diving too deep into specifically snack sticks or sausage, but, um, you know, that's pretty similar for both. I'll use that disc or the, the three gates disc for both um, snack sticks and sausage, and I'll grind them through. And then I'll definitely make sure my pork fat is almost frozen. Okay. So then I'll run pork fat through the grinder and obviously measure them both out um, mm-hmm. using whatever your percentage is. I like my meat pretty lean. And so I usually do, uh, you know, 20% fat, 80% venison or elk, but there's, there's other individuals that, you know, if you want it to taste better, I mean, you can go a third, you know, pork right. and two thirds venison, you know, kick that up a notch for your snack sticks and brats. Right. Mm-hmm. What were we running the last little 
Yeah, so I think similar to that, we kind of go a little bit less on the fat side of things too, just because sausage though, I think we're around 20. 20, I think, yeah. And I think we've tried 30 and we've tried 10. I think yeah. we've kind of tried each one. But yeah. Yeah, that 20 mark seems to be a pretty uh, pretty good line. And then you get an experiment from there, right? It's definitely a preference thing, I think. Guys, there's certain guys you might want a bit more fat in there and some who want to cut it back. Totally up to you, but this part of the the fun in the in the process of doing it yourself, you start to figure that out after a while. Yeah, if it's eating sagebrush, going a little bit more on the pork side. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> mask some of that. Yep. And yep. when you're cubing up the uh, the fat back and the the meat, what size chunks are you doing with your grinder? Because mine's a pretty low horsepower, I I have to do you know two inch by two inch. Cause they're pretty squishy. Right. You, know, you could probably mm-hmm. do three inch by three inch. And yeah. I, I usually try to do um, sticks almost. I don't know if you can visualize that instead of, mm. instead of just squares. Oh, okay. I usually try to cut them into strips and right. they feed into the easier to just dr- like feed right into the grinder. Gotcha. I almost don't even have to use the, you know, the tool to push the meat down. And as far as the, the recipe side of things, I think it's going to be different for, sausages and snack sticks but have you found ones that you like and then modified them or you stick into certain recipes you've found so i have and maybe we get to that at the end if you're okay with yeah that. yeah definitely man for sure and so at that point i i will apply um the seasoning into the meat you know whether whatever the mixture is the 80 20 or 90 10 depending on if it's a snack stick or sausage hand mix it not too much just to get it around and then i actually prefer to freeze it okay. almost like visualize freezing it like a meatloaf gotcha um and i'll use storage bags and i'll actually make my own storage large you know uh, vacuum seal bag for that 10 pounds of meat and i'll vacuum seal vacuum seal it and i'll try to freeze it maybe not all the way through but i'll i'll try to freeze it to where it's, you know, I mean, it's partially frozen. Right. And the reason I do that is when I take it out of the freezer, cut it out of the bag, I can cut it into very specific sizes and lengths and it holds shape. And what it also does is it just runs through the grinder much more efficiently. Okay. So if it gets too hot, the fats start to break apart. It gets really sticky and I don't know if you guys have noticed that on that second go through, it can take you almost twice as long as yeah. the first go through because it gets super sticky. Totally. So because it's partially frozen, it's still grinding it, still combining it, um, but it's going through exponentially quicker. Right. And it's not allowing the fats to start to basically loosen. And so it's, uh, I, I literally, I, that's the only way I'll do it is to partially freeze it and mm-hmm. then run it through the grinder partially frozen for the second nice. process. And I'll use the the smaller, the, not the smallest disc, but the next size down for my sausage. And I think I'll use the one eighth for snack sticks. Okay. But I'll, I'll run that through um, that second time. And then, you know, at that point, if I'm adding jalapeno or if I'm ha- adding high temp cheddar, I'll add it in at that, at that time on that last grind. And if you are putting in jalapenos, Wear gloves. Yeah, good, last thing I want to do is have burning fingers for the next three days. Yeah, we all know where that goes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> are you finding, so, like with the refreezing, are you finding that this is like a two-day thing? Because when Mike and I first started this, we were like, let's do a, a sausage-making day. And then it becomes, even in smaller batches sometimes, it seems that um, with the refreezing and and the curing and all that kind of stuff. It almost has to be like a sausage making weekend. Yeah, I, I agree with that. My, I, uh, you know, to call out, it's a lot easier for me to do these in, in pieces um, mm-hmm. just because of my family and that stuff. Um, I'll usually separate it within two days and just take it easy and yeah. not try to make it a job, but to just kind of make it more fun. Um, right. And you definitely don't have to freeze it. That's just a tactic that I've found that, saves me so much more time than the stickiness that ensue, ensues uh, after, you know, trying to process it right away after you've done the first grind. Yeah, no, that's a good tip. And I think that's how we blew the KitchenAid. <laughs> it was just taking too long and it was, it was struggling to push that second uh, batch through there uh, just because it was getting too warm and the fat was getting stuck in there. So that's an awesome point. 
I definitely recommend you trying it. It'll, yeah. It'll, it'll definitely save you guys some time. Cool. With, with your uh, casings and your fat, are you getting them from somewhere in particular or you just go down to your local butcher and you find in farms or where are you going to source that stuff? Yeah. So not to sound organic <laughs> mm-hmm. or uh, it, by no means intentional. If I have to, I'll go to you know the grocery store and get some pork fat. Um, but my, my wife's cousin raises pigs. Perfect. So we get our pork for, um, that's just because it's convenient. But I mean, I've, you know, last year in uh, deer camp in PA, we just ran to a local grocery store and, yeah. you know, they sold. I mean, it's super inexpensive. You're just going to throw it away anyway. So yeah, uh, you can just pick up the fat clippings there. I will, I will say that I love to add a pound of bacon. Mm. Nice. Everybody loves you know, bacon. <laughs> you can't go wrong with bacon. Yeah. Can't. So my sausage, I'll do one pound fat. Um, or like pork butt is yep. another thing I'll throw in there, uh, as long as it's got a, you know, high fat content mm-hmm. and then I'll do one pound of, of bacon and it just, I don't know, I think it just makes it a little bit fattier, greasier. Yeah. Um, not as dry. I took it to a whole new level, Corey. I bought a pig <laughs> and, uh, it's fattening up as we speak. We'll probably be harvesting it at the end of October here or early November. And that's going to be used for sausage making so that'll be interesting there you go yeah (laughs) (laughs) that's gonna be a whole couple of podcasts in itself i think (laughs) that whole process because we're gonna go up there and and butcher it and everything so it should be interesting i haven't met it yet yeah it's probably i haven't been up there in a bit but i think it's probably pretty fat and ugly by this point (laughs) (laughs) it's it's pretty nice when you have you know when you start doing things like that and you fill your freezer with a variety of meats totally um it's it's pretty convenient. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So where do you want to go next with uh, with the processing? From there, just you know, fill your stuffer. And this again, this is definitely a, a piece of equipment I highly recommend investing okay. in. Um, because I do ten pound batches, I'd recommend that you I think they come in like a twelve pound, uh, eleven or twelve pound sizes, so that way you can fit easily ten pounds of meat inside okay. of it. From there, it's pretty straightforward. Just stuffing the casings. Casings are another conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I've tried fresh collagen casings. I've tried, you know, natural hog casings. And I, I will say for sausage that is going to be smoked, um, you know, the natural hog casings are, are it. Um, Walton Zinc sells a tubed natural hog casing, which makes it a lot easier to get on. Okay. Uh, you know, that, that stuff or tube. Yeah. It makes it a lot quicker, a lot easier. I, I'll also say I prefer a 28 to 30 millimeter casing. Okay. Um, that way it fits on a hot dog bun easier. Gotcha. And you end up getting more brats out of it, right? Instead of a 32 millimeter casing. Right. So you get, you get a few extra links. Cool. Yeah. But I mean, if, if for first time, I would assume fresh collagen. They're uniformed, easy to handle. You don't have to clean them. Um, really, really simple. To use the only hard part that I found is really getting the casing to bond okay. well at the end. Whereas natural hog casings, uh, I think you can just, they're easier to handle or hang. That's okay. the other thing is you can't hang collagen casings. They're just not strong enough. Gotcha. Um, and for me, I use a, uh, a camp chef smoker okay. and mm. I just lay them flat so I can use collagen casings instead of hog casings. Cool. Um, yeah. So it's just, for me, it depends on convenience. Like, uh, sometimes I'll, I'll just smoke as a, you know, uh, as they are roped, right. I won't even link them. And then, you know, if I'm going to be serving them immediately after smoking, I just slice them instead of twisting them. I'll just cut them. Okay. And it's a lot easier that hmm. way for kind of quick use. But if I know I'm going to freeze them in links, obviously, uh, you know, I'll, I'll use the natural hog casing. It's just holds up better again right. and it smokes better. Cool. cool. Um, Corey, when you, after you stuff the sausage, do you, um, do you hang them just to let them drip or like, you know, I've read in Hank Shaw's and this is something that I haven't done or we haven't done, but I've heard, um, from a sausage perspective, fresh, fresh sausage, um, getting a, a pin and kind of like pricking the outside of the sausage and then letting them hang and air dry for a while. If it's in a fridge, um, is is really good practice, but uh, 
you know, Hank Shaw's definitely a connoisseur of the uh, charcuterie. And uh, that's something that we've wanted to try, but it's another one of those steps where it takes like you're adding another day, right? <laughs> yeah. It takes time. Yeah. You, so uh, I'll be candid. I just stuff them mm-hmm. um, and put them in my smoker. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Um, but <laughs> it is, it is recommended. Um, so the idea of poking them, right. You can actually buy a little sausage tool that, that you can poke them, gets the air out. Mm. Um, you definitely don't want air. What will end up happening sometimes is those air pockets can fill up with fat, um, or it just looks awkward Mm -hmm. or it doesn't bond correctly. And so I think it is, you know, when you're stuffing, it's an art to make sure that you're stuffing without any air pockets. Right. Um, but it's also pretty safe to just go around and, and poke some holes, um, in the sausage, it is important to dry it. Um, you know, you, you read that a lot. I've just moved them. I mean, I just basically move them outside for like 10 minutes okay. and then I'll put them in the smoker. Um, and for me, this is where I really dry it is that, you know, you almost, you kind of want it to be room temperature ish before putting it in the smoker. You don't really want the meat to still be exponentially cold. Mm-hmm. Um, it just gives it a, it's the same reason why you put a steak out on the counter and make sure that it's room temperature, right. uh, just cooks more evenly. And so you, you want to consider that, but I'm definitely, I'm definitely the guy who just throws them in the smoker. <laughs> it doesn't <laughs> nice. wait. Yeah, how long are you putting them in the smoker for? So the smoking process is what's really important. Like the, the temperature and the timing to help everything cook evenly, um, once you cook the outside, it changes the consistency of it if it's not done evenly. And, and as I said, I'm, I'm still very much an amateur. Um, you know, I spoke with Kurt a little bit today just to make sure I had some facts right. Every time I talk to him, he blows my mind. <laughs> um, but, you know, just simply put, start it slow. Um, I'll usually do, a, because my smoker doesn't go low, like 125 to 140, yeah. I just open the, the lid a bit. Um, and I'll do that for almost two hours, hmm. trying to keep it to around 125 to 140. Hmm. There's some people out there that keep it at 120, 130 for an hour and 140, 150 for an hour, and then potentially around 160 for a couple hours and then crank it up a little bit more to finish them off. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I'm pretty like, I'm kind of doing things for more than an hour <laughs> at a mm-hmm. time. So, right. Um, I, like I said, my preference is anywhere between 125, 140 for two hours and then around 150, 160 for another two hours. And then if I, if it's just lingering at 150 internal temperature, I'll crank it up, but I will never go a hundred above 190. I found myself once wanting to rush it and bumped it up above 190 to like mm-hmm. 210. Mm. And what will happen is you cook it too fast and you start to separate the fat. Mm. And that's when you get that Twinkie type snack stick where okay. all the fat's on the outside and the meat's in the middle. Mm. And it's because you've overheated it and you've separated the fat from the meat. And now you've, yeah, now you've just got fat paste and meat. Mm. So Interesting. slow, always got to be slow. Um, and so I'd never go over 190, but I'll crank it to around 185, 190 just to bump that internal temperature to 160. And I try to get my snack six to 160, my sausage. I'm okay with it anywhere between 150, 155 internal temperature because I'm always throwing it on the grill um, to cook it mm-hmm. when I'm ready to eat it. So right. I, I don't need it that well. I mean, I know some people that only go to 140, 145. I think 145 is probably the minimum. That's, mm-hmm. I feel like FDA approved, like that's considered cooked. Right. Mm-hmm. So I wouldn't recommend cooking it or smoking it anywhere below 145. Cool. I'll just say that. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Smoking's not something we've done yet. And that's definitely just fish. Yeah. Just fish, but uh, nothing on the sausage side. So no, we should try that next. Yeah. Cause yeah. you can, we've got a Bradley and it, it's not the digital one. So totally understand the, um, it's a bit of a pain to keep it at a certain temperature. You have to keep opening and closing the doors and doing whatever you can to, to kind of work with it. But yeah, I mean, I think we can pop the rack out, racks out and then you hang the sausages, yeah, right? Sure. So we should try That's, it. That's, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, and the temperature thing is what I've found to be important. And I'm sure this is what you read, um, is the temperature and the final 
water bath is really what gets the snap in the snack stick mm. and really what bonds the meat okay. to the casing. Um, so it's, it's an, it's, it's pretty important to a consistent snack stick or sausage. Cool. Nice. Oh, what's the uh, water bath? Is that like an ice bath? Yeah. So you, you basically, you want to stop it from cooking, right? Mm -hmm. Um, you get to that internal temp and you're done. And so to get it to stop, um, you just throw it. Some people shower, they just kind of shower cold water on it. I'm again, easy is better for me. So I just fill that lug or meat tote that I was just using with water and ice. And I just take them off the smoker and throw them right in that water bath. Mm. Um, with ice cubes. And I do that for about 10, 15 minutes, take them out, let them sit. It's important to then let them get to kind of cool down before you vacuum seal them and throw them in the freezer. So I'll let them sit out for another hour or two okay. um, or cover them with a towel and leave them overnight. <laughs> nice. Nice. Yeah. And then I guess from there, unless there's anything else you want to throw in, you're just packaging and storing everything. Yeah. That's, uh, the good that's part. about it. Yeah. That's the, cool. the, the, you know, Depending on if I know I've got a couple group trips, I'll package, you know, a few more, you know, I'll package my party bags <laughs> where it's, you know, more than four sausages, you know, it might be like 10 sausages and same with my snack sticks. Um, but usually it's six snack sticks to a package usually works pretty well for me for, nice. you know, uh, a protein out in the field. You know, for example, on my recent elk hunt, I just bring one of those and that was my lunch and my dinner. Hmm. Um, you know, combined with some other stuff as well. Yeah. Cool. Have you ever done, um, like summer sausage, like bigger, kind of thicker, um, you know, you have to smoke it, but, uh, I imagine yeah. it takes quite a while to do. They definitely take longer. Um, I, I didn't really notice much of a smoke flavor because of that. The, the casing that you put them in, it's pretty, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know how permeable it really is. Mm -hmm. Um, it just takes longer. They're actually, it's almost what I would recommend for you to smoke first because you just stuff them in a big bag and right. then you tie them off and you hang them right. and then you just cook them, um, you know, following probably a similar timing mm -hmm. timeline. Um, it's just going to take longer because it's a, you know, obviously a larger amount of meat. Right. So similar steps, but just like longer duration at each one kind of thing. Yep. yep. Yeah. Okay. Cool, man. We've, we've already flying through this thing. Is there anything else you want to add to processing? Did just dawn on me. I didn't really talk anything about sure cure or pink cure. You know, when you're really, you know, at the final stage is when I usually add the cure and most seasoning kits will come with it. So okay. you don't have to worry about it. Um, you, you do have to measure everything out, right? So because I do everything by 10 pound batches, um, you know, most seasoning kits come in 25 pound batches, okay. which the hide wild game stuff does offer 10 pound, uh, seasoning kits, which is really convenient. You don't have to do the measuring out, but, uh, the sheer cure, don't be intimidated by it. It is, um, you know, it, it's what basically, and again, I, I should know terminology a lot better. I just, I just do it. Um, and yeah. don't think much about it. It's, it's really what stabilizes the meat. It's what, what will, you know, it's what gives the red or pink to the sausage instead of the brown. So it's definitely a critical component mm. to making gotcha. smoking hmm. sausage. Fresh sausage, you don't need it. Don't mm. use it. Right. Anything like a brat, uh, anything you're not going to smoke or, you know, uh, I mean, you don't even, I mean, you can make sausage without a smoker. You can just use your oven. There's just no smoke added right. to it. Right. So anything that you're going to cure, I guess, um, you know, you're definitely going to need to utilize the pink cure, the sure cure. Cool. Well, yeah, thanks for walking us through that. Uh, totally know what you mean. Like butchers are, are good at what they do. And if you want to bring your meat there, then that's great. But there's something rewarding about, you know, when you can say to someone, you know, try this pepperoni or this sausage and they're like, oh yeah, you hunted this deer, right? It's like, well, yeah, but we also, you know, dealt with the meat here. We packaged it. We, um, you know, we pulled it out, we seasoned it, we ground it, we made this sausage from scratch basically. And then when they hear that, they're just like, you know, a level of respect goes up, but it's like a pride thing. Totally. It's, it all rolls into the experience we find. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Some good resources out there as well. Hidewildgame.com is really where I buy a lot of my season okay. uh, seasonings. 
Um, but also there's, um, uh, a site called Walton's Inc. Hmm. Um, and they have this meat logistics kind of forum where, I mean, you can go in and just watch videos, read about it. Um, it's actually really empowering what they provide in terms of, cool. um, like how to, and then, um, there's a local, local place here that has some really good seasonings out of Montana called sausage equipment and mm. supply. Um, they make their own seasonings, but that's, that's pretty much where I pick up everything that I need. Nice. Three locations. Yeah. Awesome, man. Before we let you go, I thought it'd be kind of, well, when we were out on the boat with you fishing, you were talking about equipment and, and the care side of things and some of the stuff that gets sent back to you and the shape that it's in. I thought it'd be kind of interesting to go through the different layers of uh, clothing and how guys should be taking care of these. Because, you know, this is it's an investment in, in hunting and the better care you take of these things, the longer they're going to last, right? So I don't know if you find that's something that's overlooked quite a bit when people are, are purchasing this stuff, but what's your experience with it and what do you recommend guys do to make this stuff last? Yeah, so... Uh, this is another conversation I can nerd out for. Yeah. We can do this for two hours <laughs> if we want to. You got five um, minutes, hurry up. <laughs> you got five minutes, go. It, so, I mean, the reality is technical gear costs a, a bit of money. It's yeah. an investment. Yeah, for sure. Um, and to me, it just makes sense that you want it to last. And it's the same theory with cars. Like, if you don't change the oil in your truck and your mm. truck blows up, it's not the truck's fault, it's your fault. Yeah. And so we need to have that same mentality when it comes to gear, whether you can, you know, whether you can to live out of your truck for two weeks and are rolling around in clay fields, that's not the gear's fault. Like you still need to wash it. Otherwise, you know, it's just taking abuse that it's just unrealistic to think that, you know, with a lot of mud and dirt, particularly like taking sandpaper to it. So, and there's right. other examples that I can share um, and so it's, it's just a simple, you know, washing and drying and it'll, it does a lot more than what you would think for your gear. Um, when it comes to your base layers, you know, intermediate layers, fleece, um, puffies, all that stuff is really straightforward. You know, there's definitely instructions on care, but, um, we get a little too intimidated and we're like, oh, am I supposed to wash it? It's really expensive. Yeah. yeah, you're supposed to wash it. Just like you're supposed to go out and beat the crap out of it. Yeah. So you're also supposed to wash it um, and take care of it. And it's going to it's gonna last a while. When you get to down, you got to be a little bit more, you know, cautious. Down, you just, you wash it. Um, there's down washes that will just really clean the down. If you don't wash down, your sweat will build up. It will actually weight the down. It'll also cause the down to stick and clump, which will then create cold spots. Hmm. And so washing it with that down wash will almost reinvigorate the down. The The one part to down that people get nervous about is when they take it out of the washing machine and it's just like, there's no loft to it. Well, that's right. the disadvantage to down is it clumps. Yeah. But throw it in your dryer and don't be intimidated. Like it needs direct heat. You can't just hang dry down. I guess you can, but... Um, it's, it's just better in my opinion to throw it in a dryer, medium to low heat. I mean, it can take a couple hours right. until that thing just goes poof and <laughs> it'll be kind of relofted again. you actually get, you know, better or more thermal efficiency out of it. Hmm. Um, and you're prevent clumping down the road or cold spots down the road because right. you've taken care of it. And you're just throwing it there on its own. Yeah, I usually down, I usually wash on its own. Right. Um, there's different theories out there with down as well as rain gear or Gore-Tex. Um, you know, I talk to too many people that are like, yeah, my Gore-Tex isn't breathable. When was the last time you washed it? Never. Okay. But my other jacket's really breathable. Okay, so you're comparing a brand new jacket to a jacket you never washed. Right. And waterproof breathables are microporous. And so when you clog pores you reduce that moisture vapor transfer, right. that breathability. Um, and so it's, it's, yeah, that's an obvious thing that would happen is you lose breathability because you've clogged in essence the garment. Mm -hmm. So washing your rain gear is going to clean out the pores. It's going to get rid of any dirt. I mean, long-term wise, 
dirt can actually get in between the face fabric and the backer uh, in that cortex membrane or any waterproof membrane. Uh, and with friction, it can actually rub holes in it. Hmm. You don't know what's going on, but it's happening. Right. And that takes a while for that to happen, but it can definitely exist. So again, washing it prevents that from ever happening. Washing it cleans out your pores, increases the breathability. So the next variable is your DWR when it comes to rain gear. And DWR isn't what keeps your rain gear you know, performing in the sense of keeping you dry from rain. It's what keeps the garment breathing better um, to kind of its peak performance. So DWR is a coating or treatment on the outside that passes water droplets, kind of like a freshly waxed car. When the DWR wears off, it wets out. And you can noticeably tell, you know, it's, it's pretty noticeable uh, with the discoloration of the face fabric. It basically becomes waterlogged. And that's just simply the DWR wearing off. That water that is held in that face fabric reduces breathability. Right. And often that's when you start to get that damp, clammy feeling on the inside. Gotcha. So garments not leaking, you're just outperforming it because you haven't taken care of it. Right. And usually you know, DWR or, you know, DWR failing or just wetting out is a pretty good indicator that you're also not washing it. Hmm. Um, because when you wash it, do all the things we just talked about then throwing it in the dryer, you revitalize that DWR. Hmm. Think about DWR like these little fingers that pass water droplets off the face. With wear, you mat those down. Right. That dry cycle, that direct heat, the tumble redistributes, and it also gets those little fingers to stand up again. <laughs> um, hang drying just doesn't do it. Okay. Um, DWRs these days have changed over probably the last, I don't know, three to four years. They've become more environmentally friendly, but does mean they're not as durable. Right. And so in the past, you used to get a bit more use out of DWR, right? Those little fingers were sturdier. Now they're just a little bit weaker, but we're a bit more environmentally friendly. Hmm. And so you have to kind of take care of it a little bit more as well as it doesn't last as long on the garment. And so you get six to eight wash dry cycles before that DWR is gone, right? It's just a treatment. It's not permanent. And so you can always retreat DWR with a spray on, wash in, I'm not a big fan of wash-ins simply because you are applying DWR to both sides of the garment. And so I prefer a spray on mm -hmm. and simply wash the garment, spray it on the jacket or pant. Um, it doesn't just have to be Gore-Tex. I mean, you can retreat your, you know, your, um, Timberline pants, mountain pants, right. or any pant. Um, I mean, you do the same thing with your windstopper products, jet stream jacket, Timberline jacket, um, you know, soft shells, et cetera. Um, and then just throw them in the dryer. Um, they do recommend that you keep them in under low or medium heat for an extra 20 minutes. So even after it's dried, put it in again for another 20 minutes. Hmm. And that it's like steroids for DWR. Wow. Hmm. And so you're, you know, um, in the end, you've cleaned out your pores, you've revitalized your DWR. So that way you get kind of the ultimate moisture vapor transfer breathability out of your, your cortex product. And, um, Shoot, man. I mean, I get jackets. I had to retire a Gore-Tex jacket only because my son, who's three now, threw a piece of cheese on it and I never <laughs> knew it. And it's still probably fine. It just had a perfect square stain. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Unlike the chest, I had no idea he had done it. It was in the back of my truck for probably four days in the summer. No. So, yeah. Um, but that jacket was like 10 years old. Wow. And so if you take care of your rain gear, especially Gore-Tex, I mean, that's the differentiator with Gore-Tex is it's durably waterproof. It lasts. It doesn't have a shelf life. Hmm. It will last you until you're like, eh, time to change. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a new style or the pocket configuration or, you know, just want something new. Very cool. Just got to just gotta take care of your gear. Yeah, it's, in, it's interesting just the technology that's, you know, you look at it, it's a jacket, but there's a whole lot of stuff going on there, man. It's, it's pretty yeah. interesting. Yeah. yeah. Like you say, I'm sure we could nerd out on this for an hour and a half. <laughs> that, was my, that was my quick. That was good, man. <laughs> my quick go at it. I hope Perfect. it made sense. No, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, are you going to be at, uh, are you planning on being at Sheep Show this year? I am. Uh, I plan to be Sheep. Dallas Safari Club and a few others. Yeah. Perfect. Well, yeah. we'll have to do one of these in person next time. So yeah, we don't have to so. deal with uh, shitty internet connections and that. But, <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah. Down uh, in Reno. Yeah, man. 
Um, I'll run the backpack race with you. I'm oh uh, gosh. <laughs> I, I, I retired from the the backpack race last year was enough for me. So I did break my back in a climbing accident. So oh, I do have some metal. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's my excuse for not running the backpack race. Kelly, you're on okay. your own. I, I, although you could say I am partially robotic and, and have a stronger back because of which. <laughs> yeah. It and I don't have a chance. Really, it doesn't really work. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Perfect. Well, Kelly, Corey, and I will cheer you on from the sidelines. Yes. Sounds good. I will drink a beer to you. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Last thing on the Sitka side of things before we let you go. We've had some guys reach out to us. They've noticed that we've been wearing some Sitka gear and have been asking us some very specific questions. And uh, I, I don't work at Sitka. So <laughs> if guys have questions, <laughs> uh, what's, the, what's the best method for them? Is there a way they can get in touch with you guys and talk to you in person if they're thinking about you know, investing in a, in a kit for themselves? Or what's the, the best means of figuring out what's going to work for them? Yeah, Um Call us. Okay. Um, we we have a great customer service team. Uh, I respect everyone that's on that team. They're knowledgeable. Uh, I'll p- put a quick warning. Uh, unfortunately, we're short staffed, uh, considering where we're at in the season. Right. Um, and so, I'd love to be able to pr- provide even better service. Um, and so, don't hesitate to leave a message. Um, and we'll definitely give you a call back within 24 hours if you're not able to get a hold of us. But most people are. I'm being a little bit dramatic there. Um, call our 800 line, so 877-748-5247. We're all hunters. We all get it. We'll definitely walk you through the right system, what your needs are, why. You know, we're not we're not the, the company that just tells you what to buy. Right. We prefer mm-hmm. that you understand what you're getting, why you're getting it, how it's going to benefit you. Um, so we're we're pretty passionate about that. Yo, cool. I've been giving everybody your personal number. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> That's okay. <That'll, laughs> no, I'm just that'll kidding. That'll work as well. That'll yeah. work as well. I, it's funny. The team always makes fun of me because my phone calls are always like four times longer than everyone else's. Yeah, right. I, just get, I get a little carried away, I guess. <laughs> nice. Perfect. Do you have an eye for um, you know, sizes too? It's too bad folks can't meet you in person because when you're up here, you kind of said, oh, you're this and you're that. You're this size. And then when we ordered our stuff, it was like bang on. Yeah, you nailed it. It's like 30 seconds worth of just optical uh, measuring. <laughs> looked us up and down once and you knew exactly what we needed. Might have felt a little com- uncomfortable when I was staring at you. But, um, yeah, With we, that tape. <laughs> we do it, you know, I mean, the disadvantage that we have is that we're not face-to-face, right? Yeah. It's, it's a phone call. Um, and so we definitely have uh, some easy metrics that we go off of, you know, my, my quick metric for anyone. Um, you know, might be listening. That's wondering what size should I go with? You know, I don't, especially in Canada, it might be hard to find, you know, if you're 5'10", 160, 170 pounds, you pretty much perfectly fall into a medium. Usually you're about a 32 waist. Um, if you're six foot, 185, 195 pounds, you're pretty much a spot on large. Usually you're around a 34, 35 waist, um, six foot, 215, extra large. Nice. Uh, 36 waist and then so on and so right. forth. So it's, it's not, it's not, it's not science. I guess <laughs> maybe, maybe it is. I don't know. There's numbers there. <laughs> Mathematics. Perfect. I don't know, but, um, yeah, we can, we can assist with all that. Cool. Awesome. Well, yeah. unfortunately we didn't find you any salmon while you're up here. So how about this? We'll smuggle some down for you to sheep show <laughs> and we'll trade you for some pepperoni. <laughs> we can do that. Okay. I'm, I'm game for that. We, that's so, uh, I should be stocked up on some snack sticks. Perfect. Uh, I convert all my goose into snack sticks. Um, Excellent. That's that is the like I, I'm the guy that all everyone drops their goose off to because <laughs> nice. uh, I will absolutely use it. I love it. They make nice. We I use a um, hide uh, wild game land Jaeger snack stick mix mm. with my goose and it, it turns out really well. Awesome. Beautiful. Well, we won't keep you any longer, Ben. I'm sure you're anxious to get home. But uh, thanks for your time and uh, look forward yeah. to uh, chatting again sometime and seeing you uh, in February. Yeah, it was fun, man. Perfect. Looking forward to it. Yeah, all right, man. Sounds good. Thanks. Yeah, cheers. Thanks, man. Bye. This episode of Rookie Hunter was also brought to you by North Arm Knives. North Arm Knives are handcrafted and sold directly through a father and son team right here in British Columbia. Choose from a selection of outdoor knives, kitchen knives, and custom engravings from northarmknives.com. 
They ship internationally and guarantee all of their work. Kelly and I have put their products to the ultimate test and give them our stamp of approval. Head over to northarmknives.com.